So we're going to Matthew 12. We're starting in verse 33 today. Uh, If you've been tracking with us, you'll notice that we're skipping over verses 22 to 32. And the reason for that is because we actually covered those verses back on June 30th, 2024. So you can go back and listen online if you want to kind of catch up on on that passage. But in that passage, the the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are accusing Jesus of only being able to do miracles, like cast out demons and heal people, because he was under the power of the prince of demons. So, So they basically said, Jesus has a real power. We can't deny that power. There's some real miracles being done by Jesus. There, there's no arguing with that. So we have to explain that somehow. And if they were to say, well, it's because Jesus actually is the son of God, that would kind of wreck their authority, would kind of wreck what they're going about in these days. So they say, well, no, it must just be that there is spiritual evil that's empowering Jesus to do this miraculous good. There, there must be the power of the devil working in Jesus so that he's enabled to do these miraculous things that he's doing. And so Jesus responds to them by saying, that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's a, a wicked thing to say that the Son of God who came to do nothing but serve them is, is actually empowered by evil. And so that's where we pick up in verse 33 on today's passage. I'll just read the whole passage today. Jesus says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, Or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned." So so in context here, right after they accuse Jesus of being possessed by the devil and using the devil to cast out demons and, and using the devil to heal a blind and mute man, Jesus says in verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit. Now what he's not doing here is he's not giving us a command to make a certain kind of tree here. In fact, the the way that the translation uses the word make here could be translated consider to be. And we use it this way sometimes too. Like if we say, you know, she's not the person that everybody makes her out to be, we're saying she's not the person that everybody considers her to be. And so what Jesus is saying here is either consider the tree to be good and the fruit to be good or the tree to be bad and the fruit bad, but don't try to do the mental gymnastics of calling the tree bad and its fruit good. Because that's what they're doing here. They're saying Jesus is bad, but he's bearing good fruit. And Jesus says that is not how trees work. (laughs) These Pharisees, they're seeing this good fruit in Jesus. They're seeing these legitimately good miracles that he's doing, but they're still considering Jesus to be a bad tree possessed by the devil. He's this anomalous thing, a bad tree that only bears good fruit. So Jesus says it doesn't work that way. Either consider me to be good with good fruit or consider me to be bad and and somehow call this fruit of healing these people bad fruit. But calling me bad yet acknowledging that I have good fruit growing on me doesn't make sense. That's not how things work. A tree is known by its fruit. And then he turns the whole thing around and he shifts the attention to the Pharisees and their fruit and what it says about them. Verse 34, he says, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So he calls them a brood of vipers here. And and the word brood is genema. It's literally the offspring of vipers. And any time in the New Testament where people are said to be the offspring of something, it means that they possess the characteristics of that thing. It's kind of like a like father, like son type idea. So you see two of Jesus' disciples that he nicknames the sons of thunder because they possess the characteristics of thunder. They're loud and explosive. Barnabas is called the son of encouragement because he just possesses the characteristics of encouragement. And for him to look at these Pharisees and say, you're the sons of vipers, that means that they had the attributes of vipers. Their mouths were poisonous. So here's Jesus legitimately doing good, the only one ever who has perfectly only been holy and good Here are the guys who are the most knowledgeable about the Bible and what the Messiah is supposed to be like when he comes. And Jesus checks all of those boxes, but still their mouths are spewing poison against him. It's ridiculous. It's cruel. It doesn't make any sense. 
But one of the things that Jesus taught his followers is that we should be ready to be treated at times the way that he was treated. Matthew 10, 25, Jesus said, it's enough, it's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? It's just something that we can expect. Anyone who, who decides that they're going to be faithful to Jesus and follow Jesus can also expect at times to be the recipient of some poisonous words that get directed their way. And you see this pattern all throughout scripture. You go to Acts chapter 14 and, and the followers of Jesus are going out. They're spreading the good news of Jesus. And it says in verse one, now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and they spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So again, poisonous words directed at those who are going to, to speak the truth. This isn't uncommon. So this means that we should be wise in how we hear and how we discern, careful to avoid hearing gossip, and also prepared as Christians to have to persevere through some of that poisoning. The next verse in Acts is encouraging. Verse 3, it says, So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So people opposed them with their poisonous words, and in response, they stayed longer and, and just kept bringing the truth of Jesus to people around them. They persevered longer, they spoke more boldly, and God kept working through them. You know, as Christians, we're supposed to be resilient people. We're not supposed to be people who easily wilt and quickly quit at following Jesus and lovingly speaking hard truths because there's a little bit of opposition. There always will be. We're called to be people who persevere, even when hard words are used against us. So back in Matthew, they're accusing Jesus of being a bad tree when he has nothing but good fruit. Jesus says that their speech is pure venom, but they still think that they're good trees. So he says, not only are you being nonsensical by calling me evil when my fruit is good, there's evil fruit in you. It's growing on your lips and it shows that you're evil yourselves. So he says, you're bearing bad fruit. You must be bad trees. And the fruit that he's talking about, the fruit that we can judge our hearts by is the fruit of their words. Verse 34, he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our hearts overflow into our words. And so our words can tell us what's in our heart. In the heart, in scripture, usually when the scripture is talking about our heart, it's not talking about the, the beating organ that pumps our blood. It's talking about the center of our being. It's who we are. It's our deepest, truest self. My heart is me. Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. The heart's the source. It's, it's the source of all that we think and do. It's the seat of our thoughts and our inclinations and our feelings. In Deuteronomy, if you were to take a truth into your heart, that was to take it into the very core of your being and incorporate it into your personality. So the heart is the self. And Jesus says here, if we want to know what's deep inside, listen to the words that come out. I listened to a lecture by a psychologist talking about how, how our dreams can reveal some of the deepest things that are going on in our hearts and in our minds. But, but he admitted that it's tough to decode them. It's tough to really crack that code. But if we could, if we could really figure out what our dreams were saying, then we would know what's really going on in the deepest part of our heart. But Jesus here says that there's a much more straightforward and better way to know what's going on in our hearts. And that's to listen to the words that we say. We don't have to worry about trying to decode a dream. We can just listen to what we say because our words are coming from somewhere. It's like our words are this river that's flowing from our deepest self and they're carrying on them all of the secrets of our hearts. That means that my words express my deepest joys and deepest fears. My words can tell you what my idols are, what my ambitions are, what my hopes and my dreams are. Eventually, given enough time, you talk to somebody long enough, and eventually our tongue will tell the truth about us. We can fake it for a while, but eventually the tongue betrays the heart, and who we are is known by our words. It'll reveal eventually our religious sense of superiority, 
It'll reveal our pride and our arrogance and the way we think we're not really sinners like those other people. It'll reveal what we love, our love for God, our love for truth, our love for our families, or maybe our love for our own reputation, our love for money, our love for peace and quiet. Our words will reveal our priorities eventually. They'll reveal our perversions. The guy who's always ready with a dirty joke has, has a tongue that's telling everybody what kind of thoughts are going on in his heart. Our words will, believe, will reveal whether we really believe that God is good and gracious and sustains us. I mean, sometimes you can talk to somebody who's just been through terrible circumstances, but they're still speaking sweet words about God's goodness, even speaking kindly about people who have wronged them in those circumstances. And all of that comes from a heart that's steeped in God's word and God's grace. Our words tell us what's going on at the core of our being. The reason that kind words consistently come from our mouths is because we're kind people. The reason demeaning words consistently come out of our mouths is because we're arrogant people. The reason that our words divide people from one another is because we have malicious hearts. The reason our words seem to encourage and heal is because we're loving people. Ultimately, the the source of our words is us. We can tend to blame circumstances. We can blame other people. They made me say it. But ultimately, those words came from me. They eventually, given enough time, they reveal who we are. And this is why it's so hard to control what we say over the long term. The book of James puts it this way. James 3.7, he says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. It's hard to tame the tongue because the tongue expresses who we really are. And for a little while we can hold it down, but eventually it just feels like a game of whack-a-mole where where our heart's going to come out in our words eventually. No human being can tame the tongue. We can't keep our guard up everywhere forever and eventually our words reveal who we are. And so that means that if we often find ourselves like defending the things that we've said by saying, I didn't mean that, eventually when we say that enough times, it's just not true. Like over time, we say the things that we mean. We do mean those things. It's not that we can't ever misspeak or choose the wrong word or convey the wrong thing. But if our consistent pattern is to say things and then walk them back with, well, I didn't really mean that, we're really not being honest with ourselves. We mean the things we say. Our speech reveals who we are very reliably, so reliably that verse 36, Jesus says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. So we read that and we think, all right, that's strange. We'll be there on the day of judgment. And it sounds almost like there we are. We're standing before the throne of God. And if our words were good, we'll be saved and go to heaven. And if our words were poison, then we'll be condemned. So is that what he's saying here? He says, by your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. And are our words then like another gospel, another way of being saved? If I can clean up my speech, then I'll go to heaven. No, ultimately, we're saved only by the work of the word, Jesus Christ. By grace, you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of any kind of work so that we have nothing to boast about. We're not saved by anything we do, anything we say, or anything we don't say. But our words do reliably demonstrate the reality of what's going on in our hearts. And there won't be people on Judgment Day who've received new hearts from Jesus by faith, but still have completely unchanged words. They have a completely unchanged river of rotten words flowing out of them, but a new heart that was given to them by Jesus. Our words do testify. They're they're like one of the exhibits on Judgment Day to demonstrate the authenticity of our faith. And the authenticity of our faith is demonstrated by all kinds of evidence. It's not just our words, but it's not less than our words. So that means that you meet this person who who claims to have a new heart that's given to them by Jesus. You should be able to listen to what they say over the long term and say, that tracks. It seems like those words line up with the, the kind of heart that's been renewed by Jesus. 
And if we make peace with some of the sins of our mouths, that does give evidence to the fact that our heart was never redeemed. So this is where I think there is like a a substantial warning here from Jesus. That it's not that we never sin with our lips anymore. James says nobody can tame the tongue. But if we just make peace with our tendency to gossip and slander, and that's just what I do, well, we should tremble a little bit. We should feel the contradiction between that and our claim to have faith in the one who loves and is gracious and who gives us new hearts. If we lie habitually, that shows that we haven't believed in the one who's true always. And again, if faith alone saves. We are saved by grace through faith, not through any works we do. But as Calvin said, the faith that saves is not alone. It produces something. And when we come to faith in Jesus, we get a new heart. And that's such a radical change in the source of the river of our words that it should produce a change in that river. And I know that our first response to this is, dang, I need to clean up my speech. (laughs) Like, I gotta gotta fix this. And and true enough, we'll we'll get there in a few minutes. But first, just, just think about the hopelessness of that endeavor on our own. Jesus says, Matthew 12, 35, the good person out of his good treasure brings forth good and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Who you are comes out. And ultimately, you can't change fundamentally on your own who you are. I mean, watching the, the Bills game this last week where Josh Allen was absolutely incredible. Josh Allen's the quarterback of the Bills. Um, He's also the owner of the Dolphins. And he, um, <laughs> watching this guy's skill, like, like four touchdowns on his own, um, like you look at that and I know that no matter how much I would have trained from the time I was born, I wouldn't be able to be that. Like he's like this whole separate thing. Like he's got a, a level of skill that's just so innate to who he is that, that no matter how much training I were to put in, I could never become that. Like you have to have some of that innate. Some of that has to be born into you. Who you are is just who you are. The same applies in nature. Like we have a, a maple tree in our yard and it provides shade. But if I wanted to provide apples, there's nothing I can do to make that happen. I mean, I could fertilize it and prune it, but that would just make it a healthier maple tree. I could remove any competing bushes and shrubs around it, but there would still be no apples. I could give it all the right type of plant food that you would give to an apple tree. No apples would grow. I could even surround it with other apple trees, hoping that there'd be cross-pollination or peer pressure or something, like to make it bear, bear some apples. But it's not going to grow apples. Maples don't produce apples no matter what you do. And now I could fake it for a while. I could go get a bushel of apples and staple them to the branches. And for like a day, I could say, mission accomplished. Look at that. I mean, a healthy apple tree. I could take fruit right off his branches and eat them. But soon it would be worse than a regular maple. I have rusty staples on the branches, rotten apples hanging from his branches. You can't change a tree's nature. Only an apple tree produces healthy apples. And in the same way, if our speech is consistently bad, it's coming from a bad tree. We can muster some good words for a while. We can staple on some words that don't match our hearts. We can impress for a time. But eventually that effort fails and we go right back to spewing all the same stuff because we haven't changed who we are. Jesus said that there are people who can draw near to God with their lips but have hearts that are far from him. And we can say the right things on Sundays. We can say the right things in a couple hours a week during Christian fellowship. But the bulk of our words during the week will still line up with what's in our hearts. And if we read this and first we start thinking, well, what are the self-improvement techniques? What can I do to, to get to where I can measure up to these standards? We're missing the main message here. We read this, and it is supposed to produce, first, enough self-awareness that we say, man, my heart is wicked. Jesus says that you say things that accord with your truest nature, and we're supposed to say, well, how could I ever change my nature? And if we think just stapling some nice words on our lives and some encouraging thoughts on the things we say will change anything substantially, we miss the big point of what Jesus is saying here. 
Our words reveal who we are. And that is God's grace to us. Because to be made new, you first have to recognize your need to be made new. We can't become Christians if we think that we're okay on our own. And when, when Jesus gives us hard words and impossible standards like these, it's supposed to foster in us a sense of our need for God's grace. We're supposed to hear this and think, I'm going to be judged by my words. How can I be saved? How could someone like me ever become pleasing to God? And that's not a question that we ask a whole ton. It seems like most of the time in our, our discourse about God and our evangelism in our age, what we're trying to do is, is say, how can I make God pleasing to people? How can I sand the edges off of him? How can I say the right things about him, change some of the facts about his nature just enough so that he's pleasing to people? But our big concern when we feel the weight of our sin should be, how can I be pleasing to God? Sometimes our central cultural assumption is that we are pleasing to God and we just have to make him pleasing to us. But when we really come to see ourselves for who we are, we have to ask, how could I ever be pleasing to God? And if that isn't our question, if we think we're okay, Jesus points to that polluted stream that's flowing out of our hearts and he says, you think you're okay, but those words are coming out of you. That's who you are. That's some nasty water and it's not coming from somewhere else coming out of your heart. So the hard words show us our guilt. They, they show us our shame, but that's just not so we can be left feeling guilty and ashamed. It's so we can be cured. It's so that the water can be clean, so that we can be made different. And in the Old Testament, when God's people were shown to be broken and sinful, God made this promise. This is Ezekiel 36, verse 25. He says, he's talking about this future day, and he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I'll put within, that I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. So he said there's coming a day where he'll take that heart of stone out and give us a soft heart of flesh. In another place, in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So God had promised that there was coming a day where he would make a new covenant with people. And in that new covenant, he would give them new hearts. He would give them forgiveness and cleansing. When they heard God's law and they knew that they broke it, they knew their hearts were the problem. And so God said, good news, I'm coming to give you a new heart. And if we wonder when that day is, when will that new covenant come? When will God give us those new hearts? Well, in a passage that we read last week when we were talking about the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, Paul is talking about when Jesus initiated that Lord's Supper. And he says, in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So this new covenant where we get new hearts is not just something that we look forward to in heaven. That's something that we're part of now. And so like next week, when the Christians here take the Lord's Supper, that's a ceremony of new covenant renewal that, that we do regularly. When we become Christians, the wedding vows of the Christian life are baptism. And then the, there's a ceremony re, or a, a a covenant renewal that happens regularly as we take the Lord's Supper. And every time we take that supper, we're remembering that Jesus already brought in that new covenant. That's already something that we've received. That's already something we're part of. We already have those new hearts if we've believed in him. Jesus died and he spilled his blood so that when we turn to him by faith and repent of our sin, we get that new heart. 
we come to an end of ourselves and in brokenness and repentance, we trust that he was sentenced for us, he died for us, then we have hearts that are renewed. When we confess our sin as exposed by our words, when we repent, when we turn from it, when we trust him, we're washed. And that's where we get that new heart. That's where we become the new tree. And it's really only if we start there that we get any kind of lasting and meaningful change. Because otherwise, all the change will just be surface. It'll just be stapling apples to the maple tree. It'll just give us temporary surface obedience. And so the first thing these high standards are supposed to do is to lead us to Jesus for salvation. This isn't mainly the path to self-improvement, but it's an indicator of a need of the new birth, a new nature, a new heart. The works that we do don't get us to God, but they always do flow from a relationship with God. And if no good works flow from our hearts, then the hearts aren't new. Our speech will be affected by the fact that we're Christians in time. Otherwise, we didn't experience real conversion to Christ. But then many of us who are Christians, we hear this and we think, okay, but that river of words flown out of my heart still isn't clean. Like There's been some improvement, maybe not as dirty as it, it would be, but, but our speech kind of seems mixed at best. There are some sincerely good things we say, true things we say, healing things we say, loving things we say. There is some good fruit in our speech, but man, I still, I wouldn't drink that water. Like it's, it's mixed with all kinds of other things. And we know it shouldn't be that way. And James says the same thing. He says, no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing my brother's these things ought not to be so. We all still speak this way, and we just know this shouldn't be this way. So what's happening? Imagine you're on a hike, and and you come to a stream, and, and you kneel down to fill up your canteen, and you take a sip, and immediately you spit out the water because it's putrid. It's just disgusting. You wonder what would make the water that way. So, so you hike around the bend of, of the stream and you see the carcass of a raccoon just bloated, laying in the stream. And you think that, that's why it's gross. This is disgusting. I, I've got to fix this for the next guy. So you take the raccoon out of there. You drag it out of the water. Now, in the first moment that that raccoon's taking, taken out of the water, there's almost no noticeable difference in the water. I mean, it's still just as gross a foot downstream. And there's no more big dead thing still polluting the water, but there's that lingering pollution that's still working its way out of the system. That change begins to happen, but removing the carcass doesn't immediately clean everything up. And and so we would expect that receiving a new heart from God, that's a huge change, but the effects of that change do take some time. It's not instant that all of our speech is perfectly cleaned up when we receive our new nature but it should be a significant enough change over time that it should be noticeable shortly and should be noticeable more and more. And if the water stays just as putrid for another six months, that means that you haven't solved the problem. There's still something else that's that's dead in there. So when we come to Christ, there's a cleaning at the core, but there is still some of that lingering pollution. Even though we can't tame our tongue on our own, when we have that new heart, there's a massive cleaning of speech that begins. And we're still commanded to to apply a lot of effort to work in this area. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. But the way for that change to continue for, for that to be something that grows and really happens on a heart level is for us to cultivate our speech at a heart level. And once you've changed your nature, once you have an apple tree, there's a lot you can do to make it produce more apples. You can put other tra- apple trees around it so they cross-pollinate. You can provide more fertile soil. You can make sure it gets enough sun and you're pulling out the weeds. You can fertilize it. You can do all kinds of things to make it far more fruitful. And we can cultivate the life of the mind and the heart 
and expect it to affect our speech. And when our speech is becoming corrupt and not building up, not encouraging, sharp, it shows us that something's going wrong. There are some weeds that need to be pulled out. But the way to fix it ultimately is not just to New Year's resolution yourself into saying nice things, but to work on the heart, to do the things that nourish faith at the heart level. So it's worth asking, are we finding heart comfort from the Christian community through close Christian friendships and conversations? Are we nourishing faith that way? It will eventually come out in our speech. Are we listening to things that will build our faith, like the scriptures and, and good sermons and good podcasts? Are we making sure we see things that build our faith, like hundreds of people worshiping Jesus, saying, I believe this stuff week after week? Are we pulling out the weeds and removing the faith-sapping forces from our lives? Are we giving the Bible, God's word, its rightful place of prominence in our days and in our lives? Are we turning to Jesus in prayer and worshiping him for his holiness and confessing our failings and thanking him for his grace again and again and again? Those are the kind of things that we do to to cultivate the heart level faith that changes the way that we speak long term. We're given brand new hearts when we come to faith in Jesus, but for that to have its full effect requires nurture and pruning and continually calling out to God to create in us a clean heart. And if those things are happening, we will bear good fruit.